20 years ago, we had a vision for a community and reached out to the community to to work and serve amongst it and uh, commence what we now call the Number 47 Community House. I think I will be forever changed and touched by what happened and what, what I learned in Ivanhoe. They were a part of us and who we yeah. were and they and they you know they knew that and understood that. One of the things that was very apparent very quickly was they had a lot of energy, they had a lot of life and they had a lot of belief. They had a very strong belief in God. But the big thing is they had a belief in people. I feel like the Salvation Army actually made the community what it was here. Ivanhoe, the first, it was very, very, very bad area. At night times, you know, you'd hear screaming and yelling and fighting and smash glass and, you know, didn't, didn't know what was going on. Those public housing communities had everything, you know, they had um, ageing in place, they had disability, they had mental health, they had drug and alcohol, they had homelessness, they had, um, you know, trauma. What I didn't like was that you'd be on the bus and people would be commenting about, oh, that, that's, you know, going to be a slum and all this. And I think inside I'd be crying out, no, we're normal people, you know. There started to be a group of young teenage boys who were committing small crimes and the police would take them either away, lock them up, whatever. They'd turn into the estate and drive all the way through, all the way down to our cul-de-sac at Cobar Way, which is right down the very bottom, and they'd just slowly drive around. When I think back on it now, I'm like, what other street did I ever live on in my life where the police drove slowly around <laughs> making sure no one was doing anything bad? When the police commander said to us, what makes you think I want to put my officers down in that estate? When, when he took a backward step on that, I, I, that was probably the only time I went, gee, what are we doing? What are we doing? We've just moved into this place. I could see a building that looked like two storeys and, and uh, you know, a tree out the front, and I could see um, the people in our church that had different capacities, I could see them in the context of these, the rooms within this house. This house ended up being um, the number 47 community house, but I didn't know it at the time. Well, at some point, um, someone knocked on our door and no one knocked on our door. They knocked the door one by one. They say, uh, we are coming from Salvation Army. Every day in the morning, six o'clock, he wake all the houses, he pray every day. Thanks God, it slowly, slowly, the people start to change. When they moved in, all the drug and alcohol and crime went. It was a better place, a safer place, and a happier place to stay and live. When Danny and Craig came there, Things were beautiful. You know, if you walked around to Danny and Craig's at half past three, you'd see one big herd of children coming towards you. I'd say, where are you going? We're going to Danny and Craig's to do our home with. Rather than having, you know, kids on the street and in crime, like, they were taking us out of that and, you know, bringing us together and doing fun activities that children should be doing. There were times, you know, that I'd go down to Craig's house and I'd be crying because of a fight I had with my mum or I was struggling at school. And, you know, he'd just cuddle me and hold me and, you know, tell me that I was going to be OK. And, you know, I didn't have a dad that was with me all the time. So he was, he is, my, like, you know, my dad. I remember Craig talking to me about getting up in the middle of the night and going to police stations to sit with, you know, youth that had got themselves into trouble and they needed an adult to supervise them. There's always brokenness. There's always um, something that is a difficulty um, for them in their life. And that's where, you know, they're doing life on life, as you were saying, is the, well, let's, we're in this together. We're on the same side here because we both want 
the same thing for each other and for the community that we're living in. Probably the most impressive thing I thought about the Salvos was they were living on site. They were part of that community and that gave them, I think, great credibility with the tenants and also great credibility with our local council as well. Nathan couldn't walk up the street without people stopping him, saying, you know, my tap doesn't work, or my cat's lost, or my mother's died, or can just come and help me. And he would either do it straight away himself or he'd arrange for help. Like even my grandparents would be like, oh, you know, when Nathan was here, oh, I'll ask Nathan or I'll run to them or, you know, and a lot of families were like that. We still contact Nathan. <laughs> we still talk to him. Well, if I need anything, I just call him. The Salvation Army doesn't translate well into some languages. Mm. And those who did know what the Salvation Army were might have just associated it with welfare and thinking, oh, we don't need to, you know, we don't need their help or, or I don't really know what they're about because their name doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I think some people hadn't engaged with us prior to that because of that reason. People came along, they saw that we were more than just that. It was, it was about community, it was about belonging. It was, a, oh, you know, I come along and people know my name and I fit in and I, I'm welcome here. As soon as I got there, I realised this was quite a community. Social housing can often be um, dysfunctional um, and, and have tensions. And th this group were um, really quite a community and the Salvos were at the sort of the top of that. There's also a lot of stigma involved in getting certain services and some people can feel threatened for a variety of different reasons. So having that approach where there's someone there that, that um, people feel that it, that person is on their side. It's saying you have dignity and worth and, and resilience and abilities yourself and we want to work with you. We don't see you as someone to fix, but we want to enter into a mutual shared partnership relationship. In places where people haven't had a consistent support structure in their own lives of family and friends and things like that, they need someone who's going to be, or people that are willing to just journey life with them and become a part of them and then be an influence. Everybody realised, you know, what a community was like. We're here all to help each other and, you know, to be there for each other. I've always been cautious about so many people in authority. It was only when I got here that he just said, look, you, you're a human. Um, we want you to come and join us. He was very kind us, no different between Australian and other country, uh, migrant. I've moved a lot in my life. I've lived in a nice street in Gordon, didn't know my neighbours, never saw them. I found my community in church, but not in the neighbourhood at all. And to have community where you live, it's very powerful. We're living in all the people together, like family. Like family, believe me. We shared our lives with them. It was very helpful in that sense that people felt that they weren't above that, that they were actually within. There is a power that comes when you move into a community, when you when you set up your home, when you open your home, when you when the word becomes flesh and it moves into a neighbourhood. Doesn't matter how good your social programs are, Unless somebody's heart is transformed or healed or whole, you're not going to see a lasting community transformation. It was a community that had suffered lots together. Um, people had passed away, people had struggled with addictions, they'd done that with each other. Um, and that had produced a kind of community that I think is very rare to find in our country. There's something, something beautiful going on there. It was just a sense of Life isn't easy. Most of us have seen the absolute worst of it, but that's what helps us connect and understand each other and look out for each other. So it wasn't until we left that I realised how rare that was. They did tell us at the very beginning that there was a possibility that we'd be moving again. The media had announced it before we moved in, so we knew it was coming. Although that didn't prevent 
you from being involved in every way you could to try and show that, you know, there's something unique here and something valuable um, that we don't want to lose. It was terrible. They had been living there for 30 odd years and I thought, gosh, we're all going to be uplifted. We're all going to go our own way. I think we're all in shock and angry. They just want to put big buildings in. They don't care about the people. Because we don't have money, enough money, we are not human beings. You have to kick us out. It's not that they were dying, but it was kind of like losing a part of yourself. I remember feeling very deceived because I am sure the government knew they were going to do this. You know, this didn't just happen overnight. It was about nearly the end of 2014 that Nathan went round to a lot of the residents and said, look, you are going to be helped and we don't know when it is that you'll be moved out. But if it wasn't for him, I'd be panicking again. They give us hope, nobody. For example, it was uh, too much to remove to my new home. Nathan came by himself, alone. Too many cartons takes and pack them, uh, takes to Salvation Army. I feel sad, you know, watching it go. And I've got friends that are still living in there. And then they'll send me pictures or they'll say to me, oh, this building is gone, that building is gone. And try not to think about it. Like it's all just kind of dissolved and gone, really. I never ever saw it as the role of the Salvation Army to fight the relocation. Everyone had a unique story and a, and, and a unique relocation story. So I really felt like that, that was our work and that was the best thing that we possibly could do to support and love the community through that was to journey with them through it, to stand with them in it and to experience it with them, um, but also to actively work hard with the government, with the staff from Land and Housing and Housing New South Wales to really try and secure good outcomes for people. So we've had to do a whole lot of work very quickly to try and care for those people who really, in hindsight, became very reliant on the Salvation Army, some more than others, for their stability. If you look at the trust that was built in terms of the relational stuff that the Salvos have done for nearly 20 years, you can't question it, really. The danger is that where something is working, we pick that up and we try and plonk it elsewhere. At a local level, if we're going to have a measure of success, it's really about asking ourselves what is happening here, where is God at work, how is that relevant to who the Salvation Army is an organisation and what should our response be. It all exists in the consistency that Craig and Danny were, and even Nathan and Karen were able to provide, which is Craig and Danny were there for 10, 12 years. And if the Army moved people around, um, you know, offices and things like that, every three to five years, it's, it's never going to happen. I mean, we talked about being professional neighbours or sometimes I've talked about as framing as being community chaplains. And I felt like that kind of gave us this, I felt for me anyway, gave me this freedom to, to do professional good work with people but also to really love and care for people and to genuinely get to know people and yeah. journey with people um, and to make room in our lives for others. I don't know that there are many neighbourhoods in Australia that have that kind of community with each other. Um, and to be able to produce it among people who have a whole bunch of social challenges um, is wonderful. I would say is, a, is an act of God, um, but something that I'd love to see happen in more places. We always say, we get the angels. <laughs> God send us angels. <laughs> okay, what did we? Oh, Papa, he was his heaven. Hello, be my name. By Kim and come, baby, will be done. I'm a sad kid, I stay a day boy. A boogie was a trespass against us. And it was not in temptation, but it beat us from evil. The bottom of the kingdom, the power of the glory, baby, baby, amen. Oh,